Good morning. Good morning. Friends, we are gathered here today to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Joanne Spear. As in baptism, Joanne put on Christ, so in Christ may, be, may she be clothed in eternal glory. And because of Jesus and Joanne's faith in him, we can seek God's comfort knowing that she isn't suffering, she isn't sick, and that she isn't hurting. Instead, she has entered into the glory of heaven, and she celebrates with the angels and all of those who have gone before us. May the light and joy of God's eternal hope comfort and hold us all. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we ask that you would be with us now as we celebrate Joanne's life and as we say goodbye. Send your spirit of peace to be upon us. Wrap your loving arms around us. Give us comfort in knowing that your beloved daughter is with you. Give us peace as the pain of saying goodbye stings our hearts. And give us laughter and joy as we remember this amazing woman who touched so very many lives. Be with us now, Lord, and through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. For our first reading and duet, welcome. I'm Susie, and this is my sister Katie, and we're Joanne's grandchildren. <laughs> you can shed a tear because she's gone or smile because she's lived on. You close your eyes and pray she'll come back or open them and see all she has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see her or full of love that you share. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday or be happy tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember her and only that she's gone or cherish the moment and let it live on. You can feel empty and avoid others, or do what Grandma would have wanted. Smile, put on your favorite lipstick, <laughs> bake a cake, take a picture, play with the children, or go to the front and sing. Just as I am without Oh, love. 
That was beautiful. You guys did very well. I thought I was going to have to be first, but they took that spotlight. And I will say that there's somebody else that's not here with us today that always wanted to be first. Anybody know who that is? That was Grandpa David. He always said, I want to be first, but not first to the dinner line, right? So. <clears throat> Greetings today. And thank you all for coming. We are here today to honor a very special person, my mother, Joanne Spear. If she could be with us today and have one final wish, I think she'd want to group everybody together and get a picture. Is that not her? <laughs> she really loved her pictures. Quite often, Mother and I would sit, drink coffee, and chat. On one of these occasions, I asked her, Mother, the story was that you and Dad first met at the ball stores. Was it Dad that caught your eye first? So I was questioning that. She sipped her coffee, and with a sparkle in her eye, she did not provide my answer. At that time, I thought of an expression that I believe fit her non-reply. No artist leaves her canvas unpainted. So if you use your imaginations, I will explain. <clears throat> Mother is the artist. The canvas is her life. The paint is life events over time. The base color of the canvas represents mother and dad's marriage. In the middle of the canvas, she would have painted five children. Dwight David, <coughs> Douglas Alexander, Deborah Ann, Dwayne Dennis, and Deanna Dunn. Directly below the children, she might have written this passage. Childhood is a time for children to dream. Oh, did we dream. We had this enormous barn, better than any jungle gym today. We played with cats, dogs, rabbits, ducks, chickens, ponies, horses, lambs, and many more. I had pigs in there, but I thought that wasn't real. <laughs> Good to talk about. I did raise pigs. <laughs> we had this forest behind our house that was a wonderland and represented happy days. I have a particular memory of my brothers and sisters building a fort in the woods under the supervision of my oldest brother, Dwight. Mother might have painted a barn and a forest on that canvas with children in deep play. Mother had two favorite places she liked to spend sitting in the swing at the cottage, watching the sun rise and fall over the lake, on the front porch of the homestead, looking over the fields of corn and soybeans. She always preferred soybeans until the gas station on the corner put in these big neon lights. Heard about that a few times. <laughs> she, so she served enormous bowls of ice cream, and her favorite flavor became moose tracks. I believe she would have painted the, on her canvas a car, cottage swing, a lake, a white porch, where she spent many of her hours in deep discussion, sharing her love and joy. For giggles, guessing a bowl of ice cream would also be included, she had her dad's humorous side. Mother was very active outside her family. One highlight for me, I got to I got involved with her Selma High School class reunions. I drove mother to Muncie to attend, and they invited me to be a part of their parties. As the years passed, the number of classmates declined. The remaining classmates decided I should become an honorary classmate. <laughs> a, a blue bird, actually. I'm a blue devil, but I'll take a blue bird too. I believe Mother would have painted on her canvas many more activities from her youth, her classmates, her 4-H achievements, the family farm, her parents, her two beloved sisters, and other Muncie families and friends. Oh, of course, the Spear and Alexander reunions were a pop on her list. She was truly an organizer and a hostess. Her canvas may appear to be full at this point, but there is still room. 
Around the border of this canvas would be the family and friends of the tenants today. She, would, she did live a perfect and complete life. Her mother was truly an artist and indeed left no open canvas unpainted. Thank you for coming again today. I love you. daughter of Joanne Spear, who is the oldest daughter of Reba Phillips, who is the oldest daughter of Wilda Keller. I don't know who it is. Y'all feel me. <laughs> In a long line of eldest daughters, I feel it is my responsibility and my privilege to share my memories of my grandmother, Joanne Spear. Before I do that, I'd like to read you a poem I found. It's based on the verse John 8:12. He that followeth me shall have the light of life. The poem is called Follow Me. All along life's rugged pathway, through the valley shadowed deep, over heated sands of deserts, up the mountains high and steep, stained footprints are ever leading. A sweet voice speaks tenderly, in the silence softly whispers, I am with you. Follow me. There are never going to be enough words and time to tell a proper goodbye to someone we all held so dear. Grandma Jo is famous for her long goodbyes. If you intended to leave at a certain time, better add at least an hour to your departure time. Because in the final moments of leaving, there would always be so much more to say and to do than in the entire time you were visiting. <laughs> you might walk to your car many times, hug and repeat goodbyes, and promise to come back soon again and again and again and again. Then, after you had gotten in your car, Grandma would stand at the car and chat just a little longer. <laughs> the kids would have been in their car seats for a while. But even as you pulled out of the drive and beeped the horn, she would still be standing there, waving. That is when your heart leaped, and you knew you'd be back to do it all over again. Soon. Very soon. My grandma was also fond of a very good long program. If you had a talent, an unusual act, or the ability to read, you were part of the show. Every family event was a time for entertainment. Circus and talent shows at reunions, choir performances and nativity plays at Christmas, awards and announcements for milestones, decorations and cakes at birthdays, and graduations, and even now, singing, reminiscing, and reading at her funeral. This is what she enjoyed. So in honor of Grandma Jo, we're going to extend our goodbye and have a nice, long program to celebrate all she has done for us. I hope you've got a good seat in heaven, Grandma, because this is going to be a long tribute, just the way you'd like it. I'm singing, reading, and speaking for you, but no dancing. <laughs> <laughs> As the oldest of Joanne's 12 grandchildren, I've been blessed with the longest memory of her loving grandparenting. She and my grandfather, David Spear, provided so many wonderful experiences to us grandkids. At the beginning of the year, each family would make a pilgrimage to Barefoot Bay, Florida to visit with great-grandparents and Uncle Dwight. 
There were morning bike rides and breakfast with Grandpa, and second breakfast with Grandma Joanne <laughs> on a beautifully set table. Upon return to Indiana, there was the annual Easter party at their home in Tipton. Joanne and David provided a fantastic meal with a place setting for at least 24 to 30 people. Easter baskets for 12 and an egg hunt of at least 300 filled eggs. As summer arrived, the cottage of Pitcairn was opened up and summer activities of boating, swimming, fishing, donut eating, and family reunions occurred. Amongst all the activity, you'd find Joanne in the kitchen preparing the next huge and tasty meal to feed us all. As fall approached, we closed up the cottage, with a party, of course, and gathered for Thanksgiving at least twice with extended and close family. Then, at the end of the year, a fabulous Christmas gathering, complete with meal, carol singing, happy birthday Jesus cake, and a Christmas tree buried with gifts for all, as we spent most of the day together in my grandparents' house. All of these efforts provided my cousins and I with relationships much like siblings have. We slept in the same beds, played together, sat to pray and eat meals together, and experienced many firsts together. The closeness of our family was something I came to realize was not ordinary. To have relationships with extended family, great aunts and uncles, second and third cousins, visits with great grandparents, and multi-day family gatherings under one roof, with family done, catering and entertainment included, was extraordinary. So, to find out that initially, my grandparents were a little reluctant to become grandparents seems a bit absurd. Perhaps my impending arrival and the transition from parent to grandparent was a change that indicated advancing age or the final chapter of their lives. Whatever the reason, once they embraced the idea and found their stride, they became the best grandpa and grandma ever, complete with matching sweatshirts stating the fact. <laughs> they never missed a birthday, athletic event, school event, or anything they were asked to attend. Every birthday was complete with Grandma Jo's famous cake. She was very picky about ingredients. I believe it was boxed domino powdered sugar only for the icing, I believe. <laughs> but the result was always beautiful and extremely tasty. So, back to reluctance. Sometimes, when big changes come, we are reluctant to accept them. Last December, when I learned that my grandma Joanne, a non-smoker, had stage four lung cancer and a few weeks left to live, I refused to believe it. My strong, stubborn, enduring, loving grandmother would not leave us because that would be life-changing. Besides, she wasn't ready to go. There was so much more life to live and experience. So while we all struggled to accept this new reality, Grandma Jo continued to try to get better and see any and all family who would call or visit even though her body was wearing out. I was blessed with one last wonderful day alone with her, sitting beside her in bed reminiscing, holding her soft hand, <clears throat> and watching the beauty of the sun rise and fall through the window that day. Two days later, as I held her and reluctantly had to let her go onto her next existence in heaven, I cried, surrounded by so many cousins, aunts, and uncles who had come to help her accept her death and ease her pain and fears. My hope is when she took her last breath, she had given up her reluctance and accepted it was time to pass on into heaven. 
for she had earned her place in heaven through her devotion to God, her husband, and family. The morning after she had gone, there was a beautiful sunrise. I was hoping she was experiencing her first heavenly sunrise, surrounded by those that loved her and were celebrating with her in heaven. This spring has seemed surreal. I've been visiting her home and helping my mother prepare it for this celebration. Traditionally, Grandma Joanne at this time has gone to Florida every year. So not seeing her doesn't seem so strange yet. I'm thankful for all of the time I was given to be her granddaughter. And at times, I'm a little selfishly glad. By the accident of birth order, I got to experience 34 years of her life. As I see the lily of the valley beginning to poke up out of the ground, I'm overcome with the realization that she won't be back this May. We won't be scrambling to celebrate her birthday or arrange her week so she won't be alone. I've begun to accept that while she is gone from Earth, I shouldn't continue to mourn her death. While I am reluctant to accept she is gone, I am joyful that her pain and suffering have passed and that she is in heaven and getting a new celestial existence with those that have gone before. So I do not mourn Grandma Jo, for she is not lost or gone. She continues to live on in all of us and the generations to come. We should honor her memory by teaching future children what she has taught us. If we continue, that part of Grandma will always be here and will not fade with memory or depart with corporal presence. Deep within us all is the part of Joanne that will go on and endure. Her examples of faith, devotion to family, culinary excess, that means you're not going away hungry, frugal creativity, vision for potential in people and objects, and above all, love. So great, it is crushing to think about losing it. I didn't know what a treasure I had in my grandmother until I became a mother. Then I began watching her with new eyes and seeing the joy that mothering and children brought to her. She was always so generous with her time, her gifts, and her love. I'm thankful that I was able to take time to be home with my children while they were young, but it also allowed me extra time to spend with my grandma and share my joy with her. In the last eight years, I've rediscovered a friend and a mentor I never knew I had. Someone who had been so formative in my life that until eight years ago, I had taken her presence a little for granted. I'm so blessed that God opened my eyes to her beauty and gave my children many memories of their Grandma Joanne. We can always say in retrospect how we should have spent more time together or seen what was to come. But then we must remember that we knew her memory was failing and we were always doing our best to treasure her time and share our joy with her. She was a blessing to us all as much as we were a blessing to her. And for that, I'm forever grateful. I love you, Grandma Joanne, and you will forever rest in my heart and my memory. this very special place to celebrate the life of my mother, Joanne Spear, a woman who meant so much to all of us. Fifty years ago, 
plus or minus a few, you would have found my family of seven right up in the balcony each Sunday morning with the McKinney's and the Richter's. How wonderful it is to be back home today. I'm Joanne's daughter, Debbie, and I'm going to share a story with you. And it's a beautiful love story between a young farm girl and her brown-eyed soulmate. Now this particular story is very important because in the last two weeks of Joanne's life, she shared her story over and over, her eyes sparkling in delight with each retell. It's a story that did not end in 1949. It's the story of Joanne and Brown Keeney. It leads to search, to discovery, and it ends in an exclamation point. Brown Jeannie was Joanne's 4-H dairy calf. She was a particular favorite of Joe's, a sleek, well-muscled, brown Swiss beauty. Joanne would laugh and say that her calf was so tame it would follow her anywhere as long as she kept the lead loose. Joanne would, uh, Brown Jeannie would not tolerate the Titan lead. As luck would have it, Joanne and Brown Jeannie traveled to the state fair. In the ring for best showmanship, the competition was reduced one by one until there were only two. The two competitors circled the ring, locked in a tie. It was then that the judge requested that the two switch animals to de demonstrate their showmanship skills. Well, the opponent's calf responded to Joe's charms. Her opponent, on the other hand, showed his dominance by tightening Brown Jeannie's lead and giving a mighty jerk. Well, says Joe laughing, Brown Jeannie just lay on the ground and would not budge. Joanne and Brown Jeannie won the 1949 Indiana State Fair Showmanship Award, as well as the Brown Swiss Achievement Award. So you would think the story ends there. Now, although she told the story often through the years with much glee, she didn't display the trophies that she earned. I saw them once during a closet clean-out when I was in high school. And I asked about them often during the years and offered to display them. Oh, Joe would laugh, and she said, someday, someday you can have them. And they remained tucked away. Well, after Mom was no longer with us, it seemed important to find those trophies. We were driven to find those trophies, to cherish the laughter and the time we spent together. So my daughters and I searched and sorted and tidied a lifetime of personal treasure, motivated by the de desire to find mom's prize. In the days that passed, we found that Joe kept and cherished correspondence from all those whom she loved. This is where the discovery comes in. Spending hours reading the letters from the past has granted us an awareness of the sacrifices, the joys, the frustrations, the wisdoms, and the sense of belonging that makes our family strong. These notes and letters so beautifully told Joe's story. So the discovery. There were many, many cards from mom to dad, from dad to mom. They were very much in love. It was beautiful to read their words and recall how devoted they were to one another. Joanne's blue-eyed love, David, says in 1956, as a student from Ball State to Joe attending National 4-H Club Congress in Chicago, he says, Remember, darling, I think you're the greatest gal in all the world, and I love you dearly. I didn't realize how much time military service kept them apart, and when apart they wrote daily. Life for mom couldn't have been easy, with four children in six years, away from home, with her husband away on training or in a missile silo. 
In his letters, Dad would talk about the importance of protecting our great country from Russian invasions, about his training, about learning to bail out of planes, the thrill of riding in a jet. He also wrote of getting demerits for poor bed making. <laughs> Go figure that. In 1959, from Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, he writes, See you soon, darling. May our lives never part again. Yours forever, David. There were countless letters from family with such outpouring of love and devotion. Joanne's mother writes in 1960 to Warren Air Force Base, Don't feel too bad if we can't see each other this Christmas. If we give Christ first place in our lives, we can be for, together forevermore. Her father wrote, Joanne, honey, your little old letters really touch your old daddy's heart right down to the soft spot. Don't think anything about ever getting lonesome to see us, for after all, we would like to see your old family too. Guess we'll just have to count our blessings and make the best of it. Our family survived military service and happily returned to Indiana, where our family of six became seven. In 1972, Mom and Dad Spear write, With our love and devotion and admiration for all you and yours get done, you are a fine mother. During this time, it's easy to forget that Joanne also managed to have a brilliant teaching career as well as keeping a home, raising five children, and calling the insurance man often. <laughs> Mr. Robert Gordon, principal of Lincoln Elementary, says in her 1988 evaluation, we are proud of the work which Joanne Spear does at Lincoln Elementary School. She's a catalyst among her colleagues, suggesting and directing activities which benefit the entire staff. She doesn't draw attention to herself and is content to see others get credit. We recognize her value and appreciate her for all she does. She kept student notes like this one. To my favorite teacher, I will never forget you. I will always remember the time you spent helping me. Love always. Well, their dreams from the letter came true. We children grew and prospered. Mom and Dad traveled and enjoyed becoming grandparents. They were together each day side by side. On the rare occasion they were apart, they continued to leave cards and letters and sweet notes from one another. Then Dad died. It was like taking the cup from the saucer. Joanne could have become without purpose, but loving her family carried her through. In 2011, granddaughter Katie writes, Dear Grandma Joanne, how blessed we are to have one another this year and Christmas together. Thank you for working so hard to keep love, joy, and family at the center of our lives. You are a model for us to aspire to. So I could go on. If you are sitting here today, chances are I know you through the hundreds of letters and pictures and programs, Christmas cards, birthday cards, holiday cards, Newspaper clippings, all of these things mom kept. My mother loved you. She loved all of you. She loved this life. She was strong and generous and wonderful. It was though mom was leading us on this incredible journey. We had the honor of this life discovery due to searching for mom's trophies. Each time we became frustrated with the sorting process, we'd mention the trophies and the search would resume. 
We searched everywhere. Would you believe we found those trophies hidden under half a dozen paper-wrapped blue canyon jars in the very last room, in the very last box. We felt Mom laughing with us as we sat and retold this tale of Brown Jeannie with res renewed respect for her past, for her struggles, for her accomplishments, for all the people that she loved and loved her. So together we come to the end. Mom, well done. And there is our exclamation. Amen. which our song is taken from. The writer of this song speaks of the Lord's splendor and majesty, his strength and power, and his authority over all creation. In it we see his provision and sovereign hand over the affairs of man and beast alike. It speaks of the things we take for granted in our life and how they come from the open hand of God. And we see how he is the one who determines when our last breath will be taken. As I reflect on Mother's last days on earth, and I stand, I stand in awe of God's provision and his sovereign hand over the affairs, over our affairs. He gave each one of us sweet moments with Mom, Grandma Jo, allowing us time to laugh and reminisce together, to be still and cry, to serve and to care for her, to express in words our love and appreciation for her, and to walk with her through the valley of the shadow of death until we could go no further and had to let her go. I will be forever grateful. Psalm 104, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the water. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. Verse 10, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their first thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell they sing among the branches. For your lofty abode, you, you watered the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. When all of the beasts of the forest creep about, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in, the, in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. These all look to you to give, their, to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. 
Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to the Lord, for I rejoice in the Lord.
quite an event, quite a moment, quite a joy to be a part of the family. Jane is my wife, she's daughter, and is not able to be with us, but I think she's live on video. We get moments like this, I don't know what more we'd say about Aunt Joanne. For me, she's Aunt Joanne. She's not mom, she's aunt. And first time we met, we were in her garage. And they would just come back from wherever they were. <clears throat> David was building his house. Even then you could see the, the traits of this family. Just, uh, Aunt Joanne couldn't do enough, could she? No matter what she did, it wasn't enough. So we enjoyed those moments because we, we've been separated a long time because we live out in a foreign country called California. <laughs> you ever been to California, you have to have a new language. Or something, There's, we're different. We came back to Indiana, we felt like we're in the midst of loving people, people that cared, people that were interested in something besides themselves. When I flew in just a couple of days ago, just looking out and seeing all the farmland, thinking, wow, that's beautiful. I can see cities, but when you see farmland, there's something special. We talk about freshness, new newness, special times for all of us. If I were to find a verse that I could put uh, to Aunt Joanne. It'd have to be that in Luke 10. It says, uh, one day Jesus was walking by a village and Martha invited him in. But another translation says, said, and made him felt welcome. Wherever you were, you always were welcome with Aunt Joanne. Whether it was a garage or a beautiful house or at the lake, wherever you were, it was Aunt Jane, my wife, Aunt Joanne, and I, we had the opportunity to be in your homes. We returned from our foreign lands, from California to Brazil to Georgia, and each time we arrived, we felt that that in this home so special. We feel the same when we come now. We were out at Doug and Debbie's house and had a celebration, what, two years ago? Felt like we never left. So she was, she, for me, that was that model of servanthood that uh, couldn't do enough, couldn't ever feel like she did the best. It seems like there's a lot of them. Kind of moments like this, one of the things we do is we remember. We've had the memories. But we always have to have reflection. You know, we're looking at our own lives. We're looking at our own families. We're looking at our own shortness of life. You know, we, life can change in instance. A bug they haven't discovered yet can kill us. Uh, something can happen instantaneously. Life, life just isn't a river. And it's got places to dive under, it's got mountains, it's got a lot of different things, and that's life. So we come to moments like this, it's, it's time for us to reflect about ourselves. Reflect with thanksgiving, we've heard it, family. We've heard about her, we've heard about David. I, I can't think of Aunt Joanne without David. I mean, how many have had your Christmas presents from David and Joanne? Every year we're still going to still put the same little man out in front of my house. Still got this little clock thing, and got little, everything, so that's David and Joanne. David could do the wood and Joanna make it pretty. So we have constant remembrance of this family. But it makes us reflect on what, what, what really is about life. David went so quickly. And so did Joanna. David in one night. Joanna in two weeks. It makes life freshest, doesn't it? Does it make you sit back and look at your calendars, your email, or your schedules, or and just wonder, really, really is, it, is it worth all that? Is it that significance? When I get my phone out and I look at all the different things that are upon it, now that I'm retired, it's a little bit different than it was before. Isn't there a chance that we could just stop like moments like this or when we're at our home, we have a celebration or moment by ourselves, and just go reflect on life. What is life really about? What, what, what makes it up? What makes it quality? What makes it, when we come to those moments, we can celebrate a life and just have a lot of regrets within families. We've worked hard at destroying the family. It's tragic. Without the family, there is no future. And so when we look at it and we reflect, and I'm saying, God, what, what, what goes on for these 24 hours? What goes to your, her 84, 86? Can we? 86 years, wasn't she? 85. 85. So we're 82, we're just kids. But I reflect, and as I think about it, I think that life is, first off, for me, life is precious. 
Psalm 139 talks about that God gave us life at conception. I, can, I just can't imagine the, the, the joy that must be taking place in the conception of a brand new baby. The God of the universe comes and touches a human life and gives life. Life is a gift. It's a, it's, it's a precious thing that can't be treated. The baby's in the womb and out of the womb are just as precious. Amen. It's, it's act of God, the Almighty reaching down and touching a human life. And from nothing, something comes. Wonderfully, he calls us, he tells us in that scripture that God gave us life. And, this, that, and then we wake up each day, I wonder if we could wake up each day and say, this is the day the Lord has made like that moment of conception to this day. God is still infusing life in me by my breathing, by my believing, by my accepting, by my openness. There's a, there's a sense of the presence and the touching of God deep within us. It's never forgotten. Never forgotten. You know, it says, so this is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice in it. Psalm 118. Well, some days you don't want to rejoice to it. Do I really have to get up? I don't feel good. Yesterday was bad. Tomorrow looks worse. So when we wake up, we wake up with an anticipation, not in all the realities. We reach deeper back inside and we simply say, this is, God has made me. You know, at conception, there's three things that happen inside that place when, when it's just God and that little unknown little thing, special thing. First, he, he gives us breath. God breathes his own breath into that little baby, into that little thing that somebody's going to be, who knows what. He gives us life. He breathes into us. Imagine that. God of creation getting us so intimate that he's breathed that we're life. Not only does that, but he, he, he gives us also, he gives us a, a sense of a wholeness. Just breath. But he also gives us the beginnings of life. He gives to us that sense that we have purpose. We're, we're born for purpose. There's no baby born in this world without a divine purpose. We are not a mistake. Amen. No baby's a mistake. God has breathed into that and has given a purpose, a, a breath, a, a, and, and, and with that comes a whole purpose, divine purpose, and as that child's allowed to grow and develop, he or she's the next one to discover the cure for cancer. We're going to get over this stuff. There's some baby right now being born to let it live, to give us the answer to the impossible. But not only that, but he, he, he gives us the capacity to believe. Scripture says that eternity has been written into my heart. That's why you always will long for something more. Until you meet Jesus, you haven't touched eternity in the sense that God meant it for you. See, he, he, he not only gave me breath to begin to believe, he not only gave me a, a divine purpose to, to live, but he but gave to me that that sense of belief. I have some, there's something more to life than just that I can touch and hold and make or demand or create. There's something more to life. It's belief. We only have some animals are smarter than us in most things. If we went out in the jungle, I'd rather be a monkey than a man. <laughs> but, the, but the fact is that, that each one of us has a capacity to believe. See, we're, eternity has already, Scripture, Ecclesiastes says, eternity has been written in our hearts. Mm -hmm. We've been born with a vacuum. Every single 7.5 billion people, which two and a half billion are like us, they know Jesus. Two and a half billion know about Jesus, but don't want him. And the last two and a half billion people we don't even know the name Jesus yet because we, the church, are so busy sucking our thumbs and worrying about ourselves instead of the lost, the lost, the lost. And they hunger for it. A person without Jesus always feels like they're missing something. Something still missing. They have the biggest car, the biggest house, the biggest anything, the most money in the world. And how many rich people do you know that are just sad, wounded, empty? Because they have the capacity to believe, to experience and encounter this precious, holy God that made them in the womb. And all he's wanting for them. All he's wanting. What's he want from us? Just turn around and say, I, I believe you. I want you my life. That's all he wants. 
So we have that life is precious. But life's fragile. It's like a flower, the grass. It's beautiful, it's green, it's colorful. And then someday it just dries up and dies. Life's fragile. Life's fragile. There's times of things that just, life happens physically, emotionally, spiritually, with some ways. We've all been broken. We've all been broken in some ways in our lives. Not only it's a broken dream, maybe it's a broken heart, maybe just a broken anything. All of us are broken in something physically or emotionally or spiritually. Every single one of us has been in that place and said, oh, what's life for? Oh, God, what's going on if you're there? We all have been broken. And sometimes that brokenness dominates our life generation to generation to generation. Because where I am broken today, I will then transmit that to my children, my brokenness. And they will experience less than I should be able to give them. And my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, that, that heredity, that, that expression of brokenness can continue on generation to generation to generation. And that's not God's plan. You know, there's a kind of funny joke I heard once. It said, you know, Wilbur, one day, he was late for work, the alarm doesn't go off, and he wakes up and he says, oh, God, why is this happening to me? And he gets out of bed and kicks it into the bed of the toy, and hurts his toe, and he said, go, well, you know, why, why are you doing this to me? And then he gets out, starts his car, and the battery's dead. And he steps there and he says, I, God, what's going on here? And he says, well, God just says, well, Wilbur, there's just something about you that ticks me off. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you feel that about God? You wake up and say, yeah, God, <laughs> thanks. That was really great, God. Thanks for helping that. Yeah, God, that cancer still took her. Oh, God, I lost that job. Oh, God, I, my kids are a mess. Oh, we, and we carry that brokenness into the next generation. 75%. At some point, how many millions of young boys and girls never have a dad in the house? And the other ones have dads that are very terrible. We share, we take our brokenness into every generation. Life happens. It happened to David one night. He went to bed and he woke up. He never woke up again. Life happens. Two weeks ago before Christmas, Joanne can't breathe. Two weeks later, she did. Life happens. The only question, do you want to meet life as it happens and you feel like a victim? and you dump it on your next generation, or you live your life out in that kind of ugliness, sourness. If you got a million dollars, you say, why is it only a million? Never happy, never happy. Brothers and sisters, life's too precious to carry the brokenness to the next generation. I know no source. We can count, counseling's good, medication's good, but until you start with where Jesus is, you're just always behind the eight ball. God was made, made you for a purpose of experiencing Him. Amen. Nothing you hear today is it would have been possible without Jesus. Will you agree with me on that? Amen. And so when you get intellectual, come on, slap yourself across the head and say, I'm so stupid. <laughs> I miss something so obvious, someone that loves me and cares about me. And I don't want to love that God. I don't want to love my spouse. I don't want to love that what goes on in our lives. I don't want to do it. We don't want any of that. But life is precious, but it's fragile. And life is a gift. We didn't earn it. It was a gift. We didn't earn it. It was a gift. Amen. We were conceived. We didn't, we didn't have anything to give back to God. And life was God's gift to us. But the question is, what we become is our gift back to God. It's what, he, what it, our parents give us life. We, we do with our life and respect and reflect, but really it's we live our lives out in respect of God because it's, you know, there's a great promise. No matter what life happens when it's fragile and struggling, I have to come back to Romans 8. For I'm convinced that there's none, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, Neither the present or the future, nor any powers, nor depth, nor anything in the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. 
Amen. That's in Christ Jesus. People, what more do we want? Take the worst hell you've ever been in. The biggest time you've been drunk or drugs or messing around like you shouldn't have been messing around, betraying yourself, and you look at yourself behind maybe bars, or maybe you've been thrown out of the house, or maybe you screwed up your body so bad it's causing you sickness, and you finally look at yourself in a visible mirror, mirror of God's holiness, and he's saying to you, you can't do anything that will keep me from loving you. Amen. You can't do anything because I'm going to love you when you hate me. I'm going to love you when you disgrace me. I'm going to love you when you ignore me. You can't stop me from loving you. And this is the verse that's it's a significant verse around the world where persecution to Christians is very, very high. I, mean, I don't have time to describe that part. The Chinese church, one of the men would say this. He's in jail and beaten up. Wakes up and said, God, is this the day that I die? But if not, how can I serve you? Hmm. Is this the day that I die? But if not, how can I serve you? And so he said to the guards in this terrible, awful place, filthy cells, beaten up, he says to the guards, would you let me go into the next cell and clean those out? Now you can imagine what these cells are. Hmm. You got a bucket for you know what. Would you let me get out and, and clean the cells of the other patients, other pickup prisoners? The guard said it was good because they were tired of walking in what they were walking in. So he take his bucket and a cloth, walk to the next cell and say, Can I clean your cell for you? All he wanted to do is show them up and talk about Jesus. See, nothing can separate you from the love. Hate him if you want, ignore him if you want, which is popular in America, just ignore him. Not when you need to. Give a little money when you need to. Show up in church if it's okay. But the fact is, he's still going to love you. You can't stop it. And love, in my belief, overwhelms even the worst of the worst. But then we also see that life is forever. Does that sound strange? We're talking about the death. Well, just think of the Easter we just went through. And uh, the women show up. There, Jesus is there, not there. Think about it. And he gets this question by the angel. <laughs> Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He's risen. Life is forever. In fact, it came out, I think Katie said it, but... The last day on earth is the first day in heaven. <laughs> really the only cure for disease, ultimate, is death. Freed. How do you measure the transformation from a moment from, from that moment in just 20 years after that two weeks when you're visiting with your mom and talking to mom and then she just takes that last breath? The cure for all of our ills is heaven. <laughs> There's no death there. There's no sickness there. In fact, it's a real image. It's like changing homes. On earth, Jesus said, I've prepared, you know, this is, we've got our home. We've got the, we've got your home here. And all of you are members of the home. We've got a home here on earth, but, but all, but all, but when we die, all we've done is change homes. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where you are, you would mean, I've got houses, I've got beautiful places, but the main thing, you got all Jesus and what a reception. Coming back for me these days, my wife, not well, couldn't come. Being swallowed up in your home. Imagine heaven, David, Harry, Reba. Put your names to your relatives. But you know that when they pass from the worst day in their life to the best life for eternity, no mercy. No more sadness. Celebration. People, why wouldn't you want Jesus? Or if you know Jesus, are you really honoring him as Jesus? Or is it tagging? Something extra. Good for the kids. Does he have that influence in your home? Are you reading the word? Are you consistent in worship? Are you finding a way to serve? Are you conscious even of your money? I mean, does he really matter that much to you? 
Because it's one thing to kneel on the altar, pastor, and say, do you accept Jesus as your Savior? Oh, I do. Mm -mm, I love it. I do, I do, I do. But then you walk out, you walk out and you forget who you are. I'm a pastor, and I will say the problems of the United States are not caused by the politics, by either party. They're caused because we, the church, have not been the church. Amen. We're salt. We're light. We bring taste and worth into the worst of hells and make flowers grow. That's what the church does. The brokenness of life can all be healed in wholeness. What can't be healed now can be healed in heaven. And so when we celebrate Aunt Joanne's life, we're celebrating all of your family. I major anything I've been able to do in my life by what goes on a tombstone. My three, my three children know Jesus. I name my ten grandchildren. They know Jesus. Are they all living like I want them to live? No. They can grow. They're being challenged. But they've got a root inside of them. They've got a, something deeper than whatever the world can take away from them. And reproduce it again and again and again and again and again. And Jesus calls us home. So Aunt Joanne, Thank you for letting us celebrate your life. Enjoy what you're already doing in heaven. Never ending. And through Jesus, we'll see you again. Let me pray. Father, it's, uh, what more can be said? We have been celebrating here in these young lives share about their mother, their grandmother, and their great-grandmother. And it's all true. It's all true. Join that her uniqueness. And like a fellow said, a strong will. But they all loved their servants. In this next generation, we've heard it. They loved, they served. May all that we've celebrated this morning, you friends and family, oh God, may each person here, as they go home, spend their time in their life, or find some time to pause and say, Jesus, I want to be closer to you. I want to show my love more to my mother, my wife, my husband, those people that I don't get along with. We thank you that the David and Joanna have shown that gifts of the Spirit, the fruit, the love, the forgiveness, Lord Jesus. May as a result of us coming together this day and the continuing on, may we be marked in, in places we've never allowed you in. May we be able to walk in such, such pride of who you are. May we look at our families and our generations after us and say, oh God, may you be their God. May you be there, Lord. So, God, we thank you for our time with Joanne, with David, with Eric, with Reba, and Paul. And we look forward to our moments when life falls apart and all we have is you. And we'll have those around us. And each thing we do, each word we say, will somehow help someone else come to the place of saying, Yes, Jesus that our lives be truly the salt and the light as we experience in the, the servanthood of Joanne and David and all of their family. We, we, we humble ourselves before you so we can serve others. In the name of Jesus.
and I will finish with the fourth. If you will turn on the back of this program, you will find a word at the top. At the end, one of her grandsons asked her, Grandma Jo, how are you feeling? That word was her answer. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I loved that old cross where the dear trust and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross to my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear man of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I may come. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a
Today we have shared tears and laughter as we've remembered the wonderful life of Joanne Spear. We came here today to this place to say goodbye. We recognize that we've lost the chance to see her smile, to hear her laugh, to ask her advice, or to enjoy her embrace. There is no doubt that she will be missed. But as we have seen, she has touched so many lives and left an indelible mark. If we think about it, because of her faith, her wisdom, and her love, she will never be far. Know that your memories will not stop today. They will continue beating in your hearts and reminding you all of your love for Joanne. And as we go forth from this place, may the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may all abound in hope and in love. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Or afternoon. Let us begin. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. For the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are his everlasting arms. For we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Let us pray. O God, the Lord of life, the conqueror of death, our help in every time of trouble, who does not willingly grieve or afflict the children of men and women, comfort us who mourn, give us grace in the presence of death, to worship thee that we may have a sure hope of the eternal life and be enabled to put our whole trust in your goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. For that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over, surely, goodness and mercy will follow us all in the house of the Lord forever. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth, you know him and have seen him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid.
For as much as the spirit of the departed, Joanne, has entered into life immortal, we therefore commit her body to its resting place, but her spirit we commend to God, remembering how Jesus said upon the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Invite to the house. 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 Um, the song that you may have received is called All Glory Be to Christ. It's sung to the tune of Auld Lang Syne. I was planning to sing the first three verses and I ask if you feel moved to join um, at the fourth verse and we'll repeat it twice. If for some reason I lose my voice, please join in. <laughs> <laughs> All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ, when on the day the great I am, the faithful and the true. is making all things new. Behold, our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light, and we shall ere his people be. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ, all glory be to Christ our King, all 